It's 7.30 p.m. across India. Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India Global. We'll get your top stories from India and the region. I'm Tanvi Taneja. And for news from the rest of the world, I'm joined by my colleague in Washington, D.C., Kate Fisher. Good evening from New Delhi, Kate. And good morning from Washington, Tambi. It's 10 a.m. here and 3 in the afternoon across Central Europe. Coming up in the next 30 minutes, we're live in the U.S. city of Baltimore, where investigators have recovered the data recorder from the massive cargo ship that brought down a bridge. And in the Middle East, tensions are escalating along the Israel-Lebanon border. But first, to New Delhi for the rest of the headlines with Tambi. Russia finds it extremely hard to believe that Islamic State was behind the Moscow concert hall attack as investigators question four suspected gunmen's families in Tajikistan today. Investigators recovered data recorder from the ship which downed the Baltimore Bridge. US President Joe Biden hails the Indian crew who alerted authorities before the deadly collision. And India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar calls on the Malaysian Prime Minister in Kuala Lumpur after his Singapore and the Philippines visit, says India-Malaysia relations poised to be taken to the next level. First news from Russia, Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova on Wednesday expressed her doubt over the possibility of the Islamic State orchestrating the attack on a Moscow concert hall last Friday, which resulted in the deaths of at least 140 people. Despite the group claiming responsibility for the attack, Russian officials have consistently questioned the validity of Western intelligence reports attributing the attack to Islamic State, proposing instead that Ukraine was behind the attack. Now, the search and rescue work at the Crocus City Hall near Moscow has uh, concluded now as Russia's President Vladimir Putin hoped that prosecutors would do everything to ensure that the attackers would be justly punished. Russian investigators questioned the families of the four suspected gunmen of the attack in Tajikistan on Wednesday. The investigators said their relatives had been brought to the capital Dushanbe from their hometowns. On March 22nd, four gunmen opened fire at a concert hall near Moscow in which 140 people lost their lives and 182 others were injured. The Islamic State's Afghan branch, ISISK, claimed responsibility for this attack. Meanwhile, Russian oil firms are facing delays of up to several months to be paid for crude oil and fuel as the banks in China, Turkey and the United Arab Emirates have become more wary of U.S. sanctions. The banks, cautious of the secondary sanctions, have started to ask their clients to provide written guarantees that no person or entity from the U.S. SDN, that's Special Designated Nationals List, is involved in a deal or is a beneficiary of a payment. This has resulted in delays or even rejection of money transfers to Moscow. On to the US now. Divers recovered the data recorder from the ship which downed the Baltimore Bridge on Tuesday, while US President Joe Biden hailed the Indian crew who alerted authorities before the deadly collision. My colleague Kate Fisher is in Washington DC. She gives us more on this and other stories making headlines around the world. Kate, rebuilding the bridge becoming a top priority for the US now? Yes, absolutely. And U.S. President Joe Biden has said that the U.S. government will pay for it. But of course, it could take years. 
Investigators from the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board have reportedly recovered the data recorder of that container ship that crashed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore on Tuesday. And it will now be analysed and whether dirty fuel contributed to the ship's loss of power will be part of its investigation. Well, U.S. President Joe Biden praised local authorities and the crew on board the ship for their prompt response during the incident in Baltimore. Personnel on board the ship were able to alert the Maryland Department of Transportation that they had lost control of their vessel, as you all know and reported. As a result, local authorities were able to close the bridge to traffic before the bridge was struck which undoubtedly saved lives. Well, DD India's Caroline Malone is in Baltimore and joins us live now. Caroline, can you tell us what the latest is in this investigation? Absolutely, Kate. Well, we do know that the black boxes have been recovered from the container ship and they will provide crucial clues um, with audio about those final moments of the ship's journey before it collided into the bridge. And it's taken some time to recover those black boxes because the investigating team said they wanted to wait until the rescue part of the mission had finished um, before they moved on board to the ship and then tried to speak to the crew members. We know now that they are looking for the bodies and they don't think anyone else has survived on this in this tragic accident. So they've been able to move into the ship and interview crew members and crucially retain these black boxes. You know, it's much like it would be in an airplane accident when these uh, black boxes provide them a bit of a timeline about the final moments. You know, we saw from videos, of course, that the lights appeared to be flickering on and off on the ship just before it hit the bridge. We've heard that on board that ship was a specialist pilot, one that actually came from Baltimore, which is pretty common practice to have that type of pilot to help steer this type of ship out of this huge harbour. So it was the pilot and the crew that made their mayday call. Uh, they also dropped anchor. They tried to steer the ship, it appears, um, towards the left but of course, we know the tragic results that in fact it did end up hitting a pillar on the bridge and that has led to this uh, nearly entire part of the structure coming down. And talking about that structure, the bridge, has this raised concerns about the safety of other US infrastructure? Well, it certainly has. You know, that's something that is uh, part of ongoing reviews by various regulatory agencies here in the United States. You know, this bridge in itself did pass previous safety checks, but certainly not with flying colours. I mean, it's a 50, it was a 50 year old bridge. It was built at a different time. It was built at a time in which container ships were much smaller. They were something like, you know, 50 to 80 feet and up to 500 feet potentially in those days in the 70s. Now we're talking about container ships in this case that was nearly 1,000 foot long and much wider and there are bigger container ships that usually come through this waterway that come into the port of Baltimore um, that would have been able to reach in those deep waters and get through to this crucial port where they are involved in lots of trade and supply chains. Uh, and of course, the knock-on impact of this accident is going to be vast. We're talking about 15,000 people that usually work in the port, a port of Baltimore whose jobs really are at risk now because the ships can no longer come in and out, because the jobs that they're normally doing on those docks are not needed at the moment. A lot of businesses have already had to move their supplies to different ports, such as the Port of Virginia, which is further down the east coast of the United States. It could have a huge impact on the automobile industry as well. Um, last year, there were something like 750,000 cars that were moved in and out of just this port in Baltimore. So really, a lot of big car companies also scrambling to try and move their shipments to different places. And we are like to see a huge impact on supply chains in the days and weeks to come. Caroline, thank you. A real global impact from this accident. 
Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said that cancelling the planned visit to Washington by Israel's top aides this week is a strong message to Hamas that Israel will not give in to growing international pressure to stop the conflict in Gaza. He was speaking at a meeting with visiting US Senator Rick Scott. Well, tensions have escalated along the Israel-Lebanon border after Hezbollah claimed it launched dozens of strikes at Kiryat Shemona, an Israeli town, on Wednesday, resulting in the death of a factory worker. The Israeli army released a video showing multiple strikes on Hezbollah infrastructure in Lebanon. The targets included a military compound and a weapons storage facility. The video comes as three Hezbollah militants were killed in Israeli airstrikes near northeast Lebanon on Tuesday, and at least seven people were killed in another Israeli strike in southern Lebanon. Well, DD India's Sarah Coates has sent us this report from Tel Aviv. The Lebanese government claims that this strike in Al Habariya actually didn't hit Hezbollah infrastructure. What it did hit is a medical facility and these seven people that were killed in these overnight strikes, they were reportedly volunteer paramedics, all men in their very early 20s. We do have a condemnation from the Lebanese health ministry and also Hezbollah saying that it will further retaliate to this string of strikes which, as I mentioned, killed those seven people over now. Now, today, rocket sirens have been ringing out throughout the morning in northern Israel, a real barrage of rockets sent over from southern Lebanon into northern Israel. A number of roads have been closed to civilian traffic up in the north, and there has been one man killed. Some of these rockets that were fired over, they actually made it through the Iron Dome missile defense system, hitting a number of buildings. One of those was a commercial building. It reportedly came down on a number of people. They were pulled from under the rubble. One man did not survive. He was a 25-year-old from a Druze community in the Golan Heights. But this is, of course, very, very concerning, given that this has been a situation, Oli, that's only been escalating since this war in Gaza broke out. And there are real fears of a full-scale escalation between Israel and Hezbollah. One thing we do need to remember here is that Hezbollah is believed to have upwards of 100,000 extremely powerful long-range rockets that can hit anywhere in Israel. And over the past few weeks, Israeli authorities have been reporting that Israeli civilians have been out panic buying generators over fears that this full scale war may break out. Ollie. Now to Haiti, where the escalating humanitarian crisis has caused France to send in helicopters to evacuate some of its citizens from the Caribbean nation. Despite the stopping of commercial flights to and from the capital, Port-au-Prince, an operation facilitated the evacuation of French citizens amidst the escalating gang violence. About 1,500 French nationals are registered with the French embassy in Haiti, and this comes after the US and Canada also initiated the evacuation of some of their nationals last week. The founder of the now bankrupt crypto exchange, FTX, Sam Bankman-Fried, is set to receive his sentencing on Thursday in a New York federal court. Bankman-Fried was convicted in November 2023 of stealing $8 billion from FTX customers. His lawyers pushed for a lenient sentence, arguing that customers would get most of their funds back. In the submission, Bankman-Fried's lawyer told the US district judge that a prison term between five years, three months and six and a half years would be appropriate. Prosecutors have called FTX's collapse as one of the biggest financial frauds in American history. People in the Thai capital, Bangkok, have expressed their happiness as Thailand moves closer to legalising same-sex marriages. Thailand's lower house of parliament passed a marriage equality bill on Wednesday, a landmark step that moves Thailand closer to becoming the third Asian country to legalise same-sex unions. The bill had the support of all of Thailand's major parties and was passed by 400 of the 415 lawmakers present, with 
10 voting against it. The bill now requires approval from the Senate and endorsement from the King before it becomes law. I am pleased that marriage equality legislation has passed and I hope it will be implemented because it will likely benefit many people. A survey on Britain's state-owned National Health Service, the NHS, has found that only 24% of UK citizens are satisfied with the healthcare services provided in 2023. The satisfaction level dropped five percentage points from last year, posing a challenge for the government over a key concern for voters ahead of an election that's expected this year. Since 2020, healthcare satisfaction is down by 29 percentage points, with long waiting lists for procedures and staff shortages coming up as some of the top concerns. That's all from me here in Washington for now. Back to you, Tamvi, in New Delhi. Thank you, Kate. Kate Fisher, joining us all from Washington, D.C. You're watching DD India Global, still to come on the show. EU parliamentarians on a visit to Taipei opine democratic countries should band together against authoritarian regimes without naming China. Easter, a time of great tradition in Croatia, sees giant decorated Easter eggs go on display in the Croatian town of Hibain. डिजिटल पेमेंट अपनाइए कभी भी कहीं भी और सुरक्षित हमने तो इन्हें डिजिटल पेमेंट करना सिखा दिया आपने आर बी आई कहता है की डिजिटल पेमेंट अपनाओ और भी सिखाओ Welcome back. You're watching DD India Global. I am Tanvita Neja. Back to New Delhi, India's Vice President Jadeep Thankar has appealed to the women organizations to inculcate the spirit of economic nationalism in society. Speaking at the 40th edition of FIKI Ladies Organization, FIKI LO at Bharat Mandapam in New Delhi, the Vice President said, India is witnessing an unprecedented growth and women have a lot to contribute in the economic upliftment of the country. When the nation is witnessing unprecedented exponential rise in economy and development, your organization has enough to contribute. You are doing it. There were no women CEOs at all in Fortune 500 companies until 1972. Imagine state of affairs globally. Not a single woman CEO in Fortune 500 companies. Today, this is 50, 10 percent. You have to claim your position. You have to go a long way. Fiki LO is a women wing of the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry in New Delhi. Moving on, India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S.J. Shankar interacted with the Indian community in Kuala Lumpur during his visit to Malaysia. Addressing the gathering, Jay Shankar appreciated the contribution of the Indian diaspora in the development of Malaysia. He said that India-Malaysia relations are being taken to the next level. I am very convinced that today we are actually India and Malaysia, we are poised uh, to take our relationship to the next level. I think very serious conversations are happening among policymakers to that end. But uh, anything like this requires the full support of society, uh, especially in countries where we have this kind of living bridge 
between us. Uh, all of you, in some way or the other, can contribute to it in your particular professions, in your walk of life. You can also make a difference adding to this relationship. And that is why you have seen uh, today how open we are, uh, how appreciative we are uh, of the contribution of the diaspora. After wrapping his two-nation visit to Singapore and the Philippines, India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S. J. Shankar reached Malaysia on Wednesday where he called on the country's Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim. During the meeting, the minister conveyed greetings of the Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi to him and appreciated his vision for stronger India-Malaysia ties. Dr. S. J. Shankar underscored that Prime Minister Ibrahim's vision will help in crafting a more ambitious agenda for the relationship between the two nations. The minister further noted that he benefited from the Prime Minister's guidance and insights on regional developments. Dr. S. J. Shankar began his visit by meeting Malaysian counterpart Mohammad Haji Hassan earlier on Wednesday. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, Dmitry Kuleba, will be arriving in New Delhi on Thursday for a two-day official visit at the invitation of the External Affairs Minister of Ukraine. During his visit, Foreign Minister Kuleba will have a number of engagements, including official meetings with External Affairs Minister of India and Deputy National Security Advisor. The discussion will pertain to the bilateral partnership and cooperation on regional and global issues of mutual interest. He is also expected to interact with the business community. India has strongly objected to the remarks of the U.S. State Department spokesperson about certain legal proceedings in India. In a statement, India's Ministry of External Affairs said, and I quote, In diplomacy, states are expected to be respectful of the sovereignty and internal affairs of others. This responsibility is even more so in case of fellow democracies. It could otherwise end up setting unhealthy precedents. India's legal processes are based on an independent judiciary which is committed to objective and timely outcomes. Casting aspersions on that is unwarranted. On Wednesday, U.S.'s acting deputy chief of mission, Gloria Babena, was summoned by the Ministry of External Affairs in New Delhi. This meeting lasted for around 45 minutes. And now we get you the latest on what's happening in India in the run-up to the world's largest democratic election. The election fever has gripped India with just about a little more than two weeks left for the first phase of polling to begin in the country. Political parties have begun their campaign uh, with full might across several states. Here's a full report by Didi India's Dibintu Montal. The first phase of polling for the general elections of 2024 to begin on the 19th of April. Wednesday marked the last day for nomination for the first phase. All contesting candidates queued up to file their nomination from their respective seats. Union Ministers Nitin Gadkari and Bhupendra Yadav filed his nomination from the Nagpur and Alwar parliamentary constituencies in Maharashtra and Rajasthan respectively. While former Chief Minister of Tripura, Biplav Dev filed his nomination from the Tripura West parliamentary constituency seat on Wednesday. While in the political corridors of Punjab, the Aam Admi Party has received a double setback when two of their senior leaders joined the BJP on Wednesday. AAP Member of Parliament from Punjab's Jalandhar, Shushil Kumar Rinku and the party's MLA from Jalandhar West, Sheetal Angural, joined the BJP. Aam Admi Party ke ek matar Lok Sabha Sarasya 2019 case mein rahe. और आज वो 
भारतीय जनता पार्टी में प्रवेश कर रहे और वैसे ही शीतल जी जो आम आदमी पार्टी के विधानसभा सदस्य है और प्रवक्ता है इनका आना ये हम पार्टी के लिए एक अच्छी बात मानते हैं पंजाब के लिए मजबूती की बात मानते हैं और मैं उनका स्वागत करता हूँ In the run up to the election the BJP also put out their list of star campaigners for the election who will be touring the entire country to campaign for the party The BJP has listed Prime Minister Narendra Modi Home Minister Amit Shah Union ministers and other senior leaders of the party as the star campaigners On the other hand the regional party the Biju Janata Dal released a list of 9 candidates for the Lok Sabha polls in the state of Odisha Prime Minister Narendra Modi is also set to hit the campaign ground ahead of the first phase of elections. Modi is likely to campaign for the BJP's candidate and former actor Arun Govil from Meerut in Uttar Pradesh on Sunday. The first phase of election will witness the largest polling phase in the seven phase elections. On April 19th, 107 constituencies across 17 states and 3 union territories will go to polls with thousands of candidates and hundreds of political party testing their popularity at the Hastings. Dibyendu Mondal's report for DD India. And we now take a look at other stories making news around the world. A delegation from the European Parliament and the European Green Party spoke about democracy, international security and tensions in the Taiwan Strait. The parliament members arrived in Taiwan on Monday and met high-level lawmakers, heads of political parties and President Tsai Ing-wen as part of a four-day visit. Claimed by China, Taiwan has no formal diplomatic ties with any European country except the Vatican. More than 3000 migrant workers gathered for a free iftar meal organized by the Model Service Society in Dubai during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan non-profit organizations uh, such as that of MSS serve iftar meals to thousands of people with the aim to be a bridge between the haves and the have nots A Croatian town has an outdoor exhibition of giant hand-painted Easter eggs that are over 2 meters high and 1 meter wide. These eggs are a symbol of friendship and joy during the celebration of the Christian festival of Easter. Exhibiting eggs has been a tradition in Croatia for 14 years. So with those wonderful display of these giant Easter eggs, we wind up this edition of DD India Global. Do let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. Connect with us on Facebook, X, formerly Twitter and Instagram at DD India Live. I'm Tanvi Taneja from my entire team in New Delhi. Thank you for watching. Namaskar.